Okay, thank you very much. My name is Matt <coughs> Southwell. Um, I'm a technical advisor uh, working with uh, COACT, which is a technical support cooperative run uh, by and for people who use drugs. Um, we, are dual, we are dual experts in terms of being both experiential experts in terms of being people who use drugs and drug user activists and we all hold a dual professional background as well and this helps us play a function we call bridge building which is about trying to help uh, professional services and policy makers uh, engage and work with uh, drug users and drug using communities. So we've been working over the last, um, well since 2014 with um, uh, a group of drug users in Afghanistan and we've been building together an initiative called Bridge Hope and Health Organisation. Now we were hoping that Atta from the project would be able to come here and present but unfortunately he didn't get a visa. Now he was going to present about the street lawyers project they're involved in so rather than presenting his presentation I'm going to tell you the story of what's um, happened with Bridge in terms of getting to this point so that Atta can tell his own story another time. <laughs> So the concept of um, a group of drug users supporting another group of drug users in um, Afghanistan came at the uh, Beirut Harm Reduction Conference. I'd worked in Afghanistan for a couple of, on a couple of occasions uh, through the international network of people who use drugs and we'd helped seed a drug user group called the Afghan Drug User Group um, that had been working as part of a, an MDM uh, project. Um, and then MDM's programme was due to leave um, and there had been some problems in terms of local partners, in terms of the departure and it meant that there was no funding support for the drug users and no professional entity hosting the drug users beyond this time. So in an incredibly high risk setting, drug users had stood up and then they were left without the support um, to proceed. Now this is not blaming MDM for this, it was a very complex story but that's just where we were left at that moment in time. So we were came, coming together over drinks, at one, you know, the late night drinking we've all been doing at this conference. Well, in one of those sessions, we were talking about this situation with Abdul Rahim Rejai, the uh, uh, leader of uh, the bridge uh, of what was then called the Afghan Drug User Group, myself, Buff, uh, who's our security expert in COACT, and a couple of other colleagues, Les Papas from Better World Advertising, who's donated very kindly his social marketing skills to support this project and also Susie McLean from the International Aid Alliance that's, uh, and the Alliance has been another supporting partner in this work. So we realised that uh, Raheem was going to be left alone so we started in 2014 to negotiate um, with the Afghan government that we would be able to come in and work. Now you can imagine a bunch of drug users approaching the Afghan government no, doesn't necessarily open doors and, and, and make welcome. So the key thing for us was that we were a UN-backed team. We were a UN-backed technical support team going in to help people who use drugs. Now, it happened that we were drug users and technical experts in drug user organising, but it was very important that we went in with backing from the WHO initially, and I'd like to thank Annette Verster, who was no, uh, from the WHO in Geneva, who was, has played a key role in helping to mobilise funding for us as a group of drug users to go in and support our peers at a critical time in their development. And also, Jumana from the regional office, uh, who uh, match funded in that process. So the first process was a, a group of drug users going to meet with the Afghan National AIDS Control Programme. Now I, heard, I understand that the National AIDS Control Programme's initial th thought was, I, I think to say that they were approaching the meeting with some trepidation would be an underestimate. I think they really were not clear why a group of drug users could in any way help them with what they were facing. However, the, the, the Global Fund new funding model requires governments to consult the populations that they're going to serve in their design of their proposals. Now, they don't get access to $9 million if they don't consult people who use drugs. So the sell to them was that we could help them resolve that problem. By the end of the meeting, through the discussions that we'd had, showing them that this was an professional approach, highlighting that community-based outreach is a hundred times more cost-effective than professional outreach, and really showing them how we could help them consult and engage this group of highly marginalised drug users living under the bridge. By the end of the meeting, they, they were acknowledging that there could be a potential to work together. And it's been a long journey with the National AIDS Control Programme, but generally I would say, no, these are people who are our friends and who have tried to help us within a very difficult environment. 
Now, what this led to in 2015 was funded by the United Nations AIDS pro uh, Joint Programme by their Technical Support Fund. We were funded to go and do two missions in Afghanistan to consult people who use drugs, and in fact it moved on to also consult uh, other key populations as well. And we uh, uh, organized a process of consulting 400, over 400 people who inject drugs. Now, these are people living in highly marginalized circumstances. So we had to bring Buffin, who has been working in Northern Ireland um, in community organizing, to teach people how to create a secure environment. So we're anti-fascist activists by background, so we've had some experience of how to work in high-risk environments. But let me tell you, this was much, much more high-risk than we've ever worked in before. But we seriously had to create protected spaces with security teams within which we could run focus groups, having spotters to manage the police, to manage uh, drug users who might be become aware over time that we had money to pay people, therefore they could just come and take that money off us rather than uh, take small bits of money. And at certain points we did have to quite quickly leave once we realised the situation was getting high risk. So, we also consulted um, a group of uh, women, and Judy Chang, who is now the Executive Director of INPUD, was a specialist consultant who joined us on this project. Um, and she uh, led a, a specialist consultation with what were called at-risk women, which essentially is women who use drugs, predominantly smoking, methamphetamine and uh, heroin, but s uh, a small number injecting, um, but also uh, female sex workers and the wives of uh, women who use drugs. Uh, of men who use drugs. And really interestingly, for example, the wives asked us to, be t to teach them how to do safer injecting because they were often asked to inject their husbands and they wanted to learn how to do that effectively. Now, let me tell you, that was not something I thought we were going to end up doing as we went into the mission, but it shows the value of a bottom-up participative uh, model of development. While we were doing this series as a focus group, I think we were showing, yes, yeah, so here, sorry, here you can see Raheem doing, who's the incredibly courageous leader of Afghan, of what is now Bridge, and the key thing was to rebrand the Afghan drug user group as Bridge Hope and Health Organization, because we couldn't, if you try to call something a group, it then needs to be registered with the Ministry of Interior as a political <coughs> group, and the idea of a political drug user group is unconscionable in Afghanistan, but Bridge Hope and Health Organization, as a a health-based NGO, that was, ex was acceptable. So you can see we did these consultations. You can see them actually filling in questionnaires, where the questionnaires are all based on pictures because the literacy levels are under 30%. Um, so then after we finished the focus groups, we also invited people to join, the, to join the drug user group itself. And over 300 of the people that we worked with went on to uh, join the drug user group and become uh, activists. Now, from within that, and this is part of the co-op model, we were also looking for peer leaders. So, of, no, there were some people who were strong in terms of being members and signing up in solidarity, but we were also looking for the key leaders who would join our team and we would then take them through a capacity building event. And we recruited 13 uh, people over a period of time. Now, we have tried to work with men and women together, but it really just didn't work because culturally it's not acceptable. So we've now started um, to create parallel development programs with women and Judy, and then we'll see another colleague who's been helping us with that work. Now, alongside this process, me and Raheem were also going out and taking part in the formal Global Fund meetings. Now, this is part of what we were arguing, is you have the drug users on the ground who have all this experiential expertise, but you also have the higher level advocates who can come and take part in these meetings to advocate for quality services so that the $9 million uh, uh, dollars being spent in Afghanistan is spent, spent in the way uh, that communities left or to go left. I've had five minutes left. Okay, bugger. All right. Okay. Um, so then, um, okay. So then we did this consultation. We gathered information that was groundbreaking. For example, nobody had realised that methamphetamine had arrived six months earlier in Afghanistan and was causing substantial problems. I mean, people were dying of heart attacks. It was you know, people who were already very vulnerable in their health just being pushed over the limit. Drug dealers telling drug users that um, if you take methamphetamine, it stops you having heroin withdrawals. No, so real, no, huge problems going on. And the outreach team hadn't even noticed this was happening, which actually led us to find out the outreach team wasn't actually doing outreach um, on the scene, which is why Bridge is now stepping up to perform that function. 
Um, in 2016, we, we met again at the uh, KL Harm Reduction Conference. We had a, a breakfast with 10 donors there, and we received a commitment to fund Bridge through its startup phase to the tune of 130,000 from the Global Fund through a regional Global Fund grant. Okay, then uh, we spent the next six months rewriting the proposal six times, and at the end of that time, we were told we weren't eligible for the fund. So for six months, we burnt our management capacity, left our team on the ground not working, um, and frustrated ourselves uh, inc incredibly while, like, we w while our peers on the ground were we had to stand by and watch people die on the ground while we... Uh, sorry, I'm pretty fucking angry about this, but that we were left... Um, <laughs> not able to respond when we had had clear commitments that we would be uh, uh, supported. So that took us to the second half of 2016, which I describe as a hallelujah pass. And if people don't know, the hallelujah pass is something that happens in American football when all else <laughs> fails and you throw the ball in the, uh, no, a long throw. So this was it. We could see that we were getting pushed out. And if we didn't... So having helped everybody in Afghanistan secure nine million dollars for their country, the key population networks at the last minute was pushed out and was not funded. So what we did was we had fifteen thousand dollars was given to us from uh, the Czech government and we're very grateful to the Czech International Development Agency, Padana Rucho, the local harm reduction NGO, and Madawa, their local partner, for giving us fifteen thousand and OSF gave me some money through uh, for technical support and we went and just launched the NGO. Now, it's completely unethical, it's completely inappropriate to launch a service for three months, but we, were, we, we knew that if we didn't do it, we were going to be pushed out. So we went in, launched the service. Within a three-month period, uh, the drug user did 1,300 wound care interventions uh, with drug users on the, on the street. We mapped the outreach scene, once again identifying trends that professional workers hadn't identified up until that time. So we were starting to spot major route transitions away from injecting um, in that uh, situation. And you can see up here is that this is the team bit of outreach workers. So from our 13 initial uh, researchers, we've now trained up nine peer outreach workers, and that's them being briefed as they go out to map the 16 active drug scenes around, uh, Brist uh, around Bristol, around uh, Kabul. Um, and then this is Raheem, the leader, caring for someone's wound. Now, people die of abscesses in this. Now, the biggest cause of amputations now, apart from landmines in Afghanistan, is people who use drugs uh, having completely unnecessary um, injuries that if they were treated early would not become life-threatening. So, um, so, as I said, we've undercover, consistently through our work, we've uncovered major significant drug trends that other partners didn't even understand, let alone know how to respond. So we've found, a, for example, people using the cold shake method, as we're calling it, which essentially is pouring heroin and water into the back of a 5 mil syringe and shaking it, not cooking it up and injecting it in a large blue needle because they're so scared of police harassment that they can't take the time to cook up their drugs. And so in the consultation, they asked us if we could give them bigger needles because their needles kept getting blocked. And as you can realise, that wasn't the solution. Um, and we've now written a briefing paper based on our video testimony to, um, to uh, try to push things forward. We've also found really positive trends, like this is a guy up at the top, and you'll look on the COAC video website, you'll see a full video of this. This is a drug user making uh, crack methamphetamine pipes out of t t merging two two mil to five mil water amps together, um, and that really shows the technical skills that drug users have, and if they were given resources, what they could do uh, to try to fight for their own rights. So. This is Raheem, who is the leader. We've now come up with a, a proposal, uh, a master proposal, which costs about 160,000, and that's what we think we need to run this project in Afghanistan. We have a master proposal. We are now submitting to every fund we can. We have UNDP, uh, the United Nations Development Program, has, uh, has opened a small grant program, especially for us, to, with the potential to take 30,000, and we're looking to raise the rest of the 160 to fund uh, bridge. So this is Raheem standing up for his peers, and what my question to all of you is if Raheem stands up for his peers, will you stand up with him? And we've launched a crowdsourced fundraising co uh, campaign called In Haji's Name. I haven't got time to explain to you the story, but if you watch the video that supports this campaign, it will explain 
the tragic story of how Haji, one of our peer workers, died through hospital neglect. And this is about launching a human rights monitoring program in his name. So what we would really ask you to do is if you have any, even if you can't donate money to us, please use your social media networks to uh, push this campaign out and to help drive uh, the funding because we want to be in a situation where we don't have to be any more tied into the politics of the country, of the international community. We want to be fun able to fund our own project with our own resources at least sig significantly so that we can guarantee the future of drug user activism in Afghanistan. Thank you.